spines. As we all know, the number of spine surgeries across the globe have been rapidly increasing and coupled with it, the number of revision surgeries have also been increasing. So revision has been defined as a renewed operation on at least one spinal level on which surgery was previously performed or on an adjacent segment more than three months after the index operation. If it is done before that, before the three months, uh, it's been labeled as an early revision surgery. So, depending on what type of surgery was done before, in degenerative lumbar spinal stenosis, the incidence varies from 2.1% to 23%, depending on how long the patients were followed up, 8% in adjacent segment degeneration. In uh, adult spinal deformity, uh, the incidence has ranged up to 58 percent and um, in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis 4.6 percent to 12.9 percent. Uh, posterior surgeries with slightly more reoperations than anterior spine surgeries uh, and um, uh, reoperations had a higher revision rates than primary surgeries. So the main factors influ influencing um, uh, the increase in revision spine surgeries have been the rapidly aging population, the greater complexity of surgeries being performed, the use of new surgical technologies and the practice of surgery also in resource limited settings. Um, we know that uh, those operated in their 60s will most likely need revision surgery in their 80s. So uh, that is why with the aging population this is going to increase. Again, uh, new surgical technologies, many of them have a more aggressive approach uh, to pathologies such as adult deformities which are still being researched and uh, that is why in motion preservation surgeries, if you see the incidence of uh, resurgeries has been very high, the highest documented, even more than that in deformity surgery. Uh, now, um, in, in resource limited settings, people often um, uh, need to do surgeries uh, without all the uh, amenities and uh, this may contribute to increasing number of surgeries. When does the revision surgery generally take place? Uh, in this study, 0.8 percent occurred between 30 and 90 days, 3.8 percent between 3 months and 12 months and 3.6 percent between the first and second year. Uh, predictors the likelihood of repeat surgery for spinal stenosis declined surprisingly with increasing age and comorbidity. This was perhaps because of the concern for greater risk. So probably it can be avoided in the younger population as well. The strongest clinical predictor of repeat surgery was a lumbar spine operation prior to the index operation and patients who had complex arthrodesis had the highest rate of reoperations. What are the challenges posed by revision surgery? We all know that it would be more challenging. First, uh, imaging becomes uh, more challenging because of the presence of metal implant, previous decortication, osteotomies and bone grafting area. To identify the anatomical landmarks during the surgery also becomes more challenging. And then you need to resort to more uh, advanced techniques like osteotomies which carry their own morbidity and mortality. So why do we need revision? Why do spine surgeries fail? Is it the natural course of the disease that is there? So we all need to delve on to this. And uh, there can be a host of etiologies of revision and amongst them are non-spinal etiologies as well. So the clinical presentation generally pain or myelopathy or neurodeficit or signs of meningeal irritation. One should try to evaluate of what has happened, what was the rationale for the primary surgery, was it adequate, inadequate, was it an overkill. The patient reported outcome after the surgery and whether the, uh, uh, and doctor's assessment of outcome may be different. So uh, that also, a patient reported outcomes thus become very important in trying to monitoring any spinal uh, issue. So pain can be recurrent back pain due to pseudoarthrosis, fracture, adjacent segment disease, infection, 
painful instrumentation or referred pain from the hip or sacroiliac joints or radicular leg pain again we know due to recurrent or residual stenosis or adjacent segment stenosis affecting a different dermatome one should always examine the prior incisions the patient's posture spinal balance and alignment and do a detailed neurological assessment obviously and rule out non spinal neurological pathologies as well like sacroiliac joint strain being a very common pathology after spinal fusion per se dynamic x rays are helpful ct can help to assess the implant position and fusion status but there can be some challenges with the previous implant as we are all aware about mri post gadolinium t1 images are useful in differentiating scar tissue from recurrent disc herniation and in assessing leptomeningeal enhancement as we are all aware about baseline tests are very important cbc esr crp to rule out infection complete lymphocyte count total serum protein and albumin levels help in quantifying the nutritional status of the patient if future surgery is contemplated one may need to resort to electrophysiological tests and a non invasive vascular ultrasound studies or angiography a prior anterior surgery has been performed what is being addressed by revision surgery should be clear to both the surgeon and the patient as we move forward and of course uh, there are ethical concerns um, uh, one should reassure the patient regarding previous surgeries and as colleagues we should not bad mouth those who have done the previous surgery per se because we are all humans and we are all prone to errors so let's look at some revision scenarios per se because they would be needing different they would have different challenges and need different management strategies so in this study for cervical revision surgery indications um, in this review the adjacent segment disease contributed to 40% of the revisions infection to 23% implant failure and pseudarthrosis to 22% thus 85% to these indications there were other non infectious complications and deformity as well the approach used in revision surgery anterior group uh, the those in which the surgery was done anteriorly before it was same as the index procedure in 64% in the posterior group it was same as in the index procedure in 83% and in the circumferential group posterior excess was there in 64% outcome was excellent in only 19% good in 36% satisfactory in 26% and poor in 6% some case scenarios uh, Uh, this elsewhere operated case of C35 laminectomy had gradually deteriorating neurology and bladder had also got involved in addition to the pain and umn signs were present so all signs of a myelopathy <coughs> and you can see the instability there and the ct scan image and we could just get the desired result with an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion in this patient another 1.5 year old traumatic central cord syndrome um, uh, there was anterior cord compression bowel and bladder involvement umn signs had underwent laminoplasty and there was progressive deterioration of neurology over the last 6 months and you can see the residual compression there and so we went in posteriorly and we did the surgery with good outcomes this patient with uh, again all the myelopathy signs bladder involvement history of cervical spine surgery in 2007 for similar complaints and further weakness you can see here residual compression by the opll and um, Uh, we went in posteriorly and had good results this was an elsewhere operated case of c5 and c6 corpectomy again gradually deteriorating neurologically and um, we um, can see the dynamic images 
so we went in posteriorly and uh, had good results with the decompression now coming to revision post spinal stenosis surgery um, post laminectomy in this review there were 11 papers post laminectomy and fusion there were 20 papers amongst which long segment and short segment were compared and revision post adult deformity surgery there were 18 articles per se um, this is uh, revision surgery following spinal stenosis according to them is quite common could be due to revision of stenosis after simple decompression or after fusion and instrumentation or because of deformity and uh, diagnosis of stenosis recurrence is the key uh, if stenosis due to previous surgery is diagnosed immediately after a surgery it is important to try to avoid this by analyzing the risk of instability induced by the decompression and facet resection by performing dynamic evaluation and global balance analysis and planning the surgery to predict the risk of junctional problems uh, the, the stenosis recurrence um, can be diagnosed by uh, CT scan or MRI and it can be due to various reasons as we talked about it will generally need a revision surgery in the majority of the cases and is mainly done by posterior approach but a combined approach may sometimes be required and um, we all know that revision surgery can be complex let's look at this case uh, an elsewhere operated case of t lif l23 in a patient of rheumatoid arthritis on steroids um, the pain improved but numbness in the left leg persisted and the claudication distance had hardly improved the bladder symptoms continued right so you can see that there was instability at the adjacent level and there was residual compression also which was seen and this responded to extension of t lif and a posterolateral fusion below that uh, another 60 year old male with back pain with leg pain history of decompression surgery at l3 l4 in 2009 elsewhere and uh, there was instability uh, and a listhesis and it responded to a t lift surgery subsequently a 60 year or 68 year old female post operative case of l35 posterior stabilization and l34 t lift uh, this uh, stenosis got precipitated due to an L4 osteoporotic fracture. She was initially comfortable after surgery, but since um, uh, after that she had uh, increasing back pain and anterior thigh pain. She was osteoporotic as you can see and uh, uh, this you can see. Um, the dynamic x-ray revealed some instability and she improved with extension of the fusion and vertebroplasty at the adjoining level so there was an adjacent segment degenera uh, degeneration in this case now post spinal trauma surgery also the results may be sub suboptimal but they are often accepted with counseling that surgery may be required subsequently but some of them do require revision surgeries <coughs> like in this case of a 20 year old male who had an L1 complete fracture uh, you can see the quality of the fixation and the residual compression so uh, and the no uh, no uh, uh, no adequate uh, positioning of the screws that is malpositioning and so um, we went in for a revision and uh, had satisfactory outcomes uh, this again a case of traumatic paraplegia t11 laminectomy with pedicle screw fixation and stabilization was done elsewhere there was instability <coughs> somebody had done a thoracoscopic anterior bone grafting with fixation 
with two screws um, uh, uh, fixed anteriorly. Again, uh, the screw, uh, the uh, post-op CT scan done elsewhere revealed misplaced screws. So they had done this uh, surgery elsewhere, uh, presented to us for rehab, but we accepted this and we did not go in explaining that he may need a revision if back pain bothered uh, subsequently. The point I would want to focus here is, <coughs> we all talk about trying to prevent levels or preserve levels when we talk about degenerative or when we talk about deformity surgery. Friends, it is more important to preserve levels in people with a complete neurological deficit because they rely on rotation while on the wheelchair and with fused extra levels, this rotation gets compromised and their quality of rehabilitation gets compromised. So it is very important to understand that preserving levels is as if not more important in management of spine trauma patients. Now, when we talk, to, uh, talk about revision post-spinal surgery infection, again, um, uh, this can occur beyond 12 months after surgery also. And the incidence has varied from 1% to 6.7%. Uh, again, fusion adds to the infection rate. And uh, late infections usually result from the hematogenous spread or intraoperative inoculation of low virulence organisms and may present with a late onset of pain after a long symptomatic period. So an inter interdisciplinary team management including surgeons, infectious disease specialists or physician and microbiologists is important. <coughs> you need to classify them into early or delayed or late infections. And uh, you need to monitor them. Lab markers alone are not sufficient. Early infection can be managed with debridement and implant retention, as we are aware about, followed by intravenous antibiotics. But late ones often require uh, uh, the implants to be changed. Uh, <coughs> cage is often retained subsequently also. So there are some principles to be followed as we are all aware, all devitalized loose or permanent material should be removed, uh, tissue samples should be obtained, um, uh, microbiological samples should be obtained from the screw canal as well, antibiotics should never be, thank you. Thank you. antibiotics should never be started before we get the culture and uh, wound closure should be performed with the appropriate single stitch suture. Uh, culture should be kept for at least 7 to 10 days because of prolonged incubation of low virulent skin organisms. And uh, uh, the, uh, we should also rule out aerobic and, and anaerobic uh, infections. We can put in local antibiotics with uh, you, uh, various products are available and we can do a primary closure but in late cases we often keep them open and do a secondary closure later. later. So this middle aged female previously operated for spondylodiscitis L3-4 with lumbar kyphosis with positive sagittal uh, balance had chronic low back pain radiating to both lower limbs. Operated upon four times before she reached us in Afghanistan and Pakistan and reported with sequelae she had been on ATT for 11 months, but uh, she responded just to a simple decompression surgery. Now, this hydrated cyst, right, you are all aware about this, operated upon by us in 2000, again in 2008 needed another surgery recently uh, because uh, it is difficult to eradicate this incision totally as you are all aware about. This case of pot spine operated elsewhere had an infection, surgical site infection, the implant was removed, came to us with a progressive neurological deficit at the cervicothoracic junction and you can see the deformity and the compression and we went in with a staged manner. 
we first removed the debris put her on a halo gravity attraction and subsequently went in for a fixation and she had good results including correction of the deformity healed pot spine with a kyphotic deformity again at the cervical thoracic junction and uh, good results again with uh, a robotic assisted uh, decompression um, uh, of the gibbous uh, fixation and correction of the kyphotic deformity you can see uh, how the results improved substantially now when it comes to complex spine surgeries uh, there is more mortality and morbidity and more revision that we all understand and uh, the revision rate ranges from 16 to 22% and the mortality also from 12 to 18% in such cases uh, tumors and uh, with the more mortality and uh, uh, deformity leading to more revisions per se uh prospectively registered adverse events were correlated to increased odds of revision surgery and all cause mortality and deep wound infection was associated with increased odds of all cause mortality in this study which was done now in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis also we may need revision surgeries which may be due to insufficient deformity correction or imbalance problems with the fusion like crankshaft phenomenon failure of fixation or sud arthrosis or problems around the operated level such as additional levels of deformity in the coronal and sagittal plane due to adding on or junctional deformity so this interesting case operated upon um, when he was uh, i think 10 years of age with a uh, Uh, corrected by a hard shell rectangle but gradually the crankshaft phenomenon came in um, the adding on came progressive deformity came in and he had a progressive neurological deficit also and uh, it was a neuromuscular scoliosis with the crankshaft phenomenon and you can see uh, it was a severe three dimensional deformity caused by the crankshaft per se So in the first stage we did an implant removal and facet release and put him on a halo pelvic traction and then we did in the second stage we did three osteotomies it was a fusion mass throughout and we had to do osteotomies at the apex above and below in the fusion mass area and then we did a gradual differential distraction over two months uh because we were apprehensive about the neurological deficit and we were able to correct this deformity substantially and the patient improved uh, in the neurology of course the residual effects of pprp remained in him again this 11 year old girl presented to us with progressive deformity of the back since the age of 1 year a known case of congenital heart disease had undergone surgery for vsd closure pulmonary artery dilatation shunt closure and you can see there was a kyphoscoliotic deformity um so we went in for a correction friends this was i think a shortcoming of planning on our part uh though we had a good correction but she had marfanoid features and in marfan syndrome one should not try to save levels especially at the proximal junction but she gradually became bent like this came to us bent like this parents did not want to go in for a revision surgery increase the deformity increased and you can see in the flexion and extension what we could diagnosed was that there was an l5 s1 sud arthrosis in this child and we had to calculate the angle that we needed to correct and ultimately we had a reasonably good result and she is doing well so we have to keep it take into consideration other confounding factors um, which may uh, need to be uh, assessed uh, 
in order to have good outcomes. Adult spinal deformity, one has to identify and avoid the reasons that led to the failure of previous uh, surgeries. There are a host of factors as you know. Plan the anterior column restruction, uh, reconstruction either through posterior or anterior interbody fusion. Restore the global alignment, obtain a solid fixation and also uh, decompression through a virgin spine or a previous laminectomy bed. So, uh, outcome is generally satisfactory but can't be excellent. And you know that proximal junctional kyphosis can also happen if we don't plan our surgeries well. Um, is, uh, uh, happens more often with severe deformity as also pointed out by Gotham earlier on. Uh, leads to a progressive deformity, increasing pain, neurological deficit. So, uh, uh, if there is a subluxation between upper instrumented uh, uh, vertebra uh, uh, and UIV1, then you need to go in for an emergent surgical revision. Um, you would go two to three levels at least proximal. Uh, longer proximal extension may be required. Um, one should avoid having a UIV close to the apex on the main thoracic or proximal thoracic kyphosis, right? So, the amount of correction required is also determined on a case-to-case -case basis. One may need osteotomies. <coughs> Lumbar lordosis also needs to be taken into consideration. A three-column osteotomy may be required in these patients. Uh, if you go in immediately after the development of a PJK, then a simple posterior column osteotomy may suffice. Otherwise, you may need a three-column osteotomy per se. Uh, the realignment goals in revision surgery for PJK are similar to the goals for primary surgery in adult spinal deformity. So, this patient, uh, extradural compressive myelopathy T11-12 with AISC neurology, operated upon before and now presented with sudden onset weakness of both lower limbs since um, the last two days with UMN signs and you can see uh, the cause here and uh, we <coughs> went in for an extension as I mentioned with good, good results. Uh, we talked about this patient in which there was adjoining level adjacent segment degeneration and we had to extend the T lift in this patient. Following up for five years, the patient came back to us and you can see that there was a proximal junctional kyphosis, there was a neurological deficit cement augmentation as well. Uh, another patient started developing neurological deficit with bowel and bladder involvement. So, uh, uh, posterior cervical spine surgery was done, uh, uh, improved, but then suddenly had a stooped neck with hardware prominence and gradually deteriorated neurologically and became wheelchair bound. And you can see the deficit in neurology. <coughs> so, this was the primary pathology, the primary fixation. And this is how he presented to us with a neurological deficit. And you can see a distal junctional kyphosis here. And uh, uh, the cause of the neurological deficit. And we extended the fixation and achieved good results. So, Post-tumor also, you may need to uh, have revision surgeries. Uh, uh, interesting example of this 18-year-old boy who had neck pain, unsteadiness of gait, difficulty in doing all myelopathy symptoms. There was a history of astrocytoma for which he was operated three years ago in a regional hospital. 
improved gradually after the first surgery but after some time the neurological deficit again started increasing and you can see the region the post surgery kyphotic deformity one he was a growing child two after tumor and radiotherapy the deformity can increase and it is well documented so we had to go in for a front back front surgery to correct the kyphotic deformity to do a vcr at the apex and correct the deformity elderly is also require special consideration uh, because uh, the risk factors are there more in the elderly and we need to uh, uh, take that into special consideration robotics comes to our help in revision surgeries uh, especially where anatomical landmarks are not uh, well preserved and where osteotomies need to be planned uh, etc so an example we were talking about csf leakage before pseudo meningocele this is published what we do is we close the mouth of the pseudo meningocele sac we don't need to go to the spine to close the dural defect and this is um, uh, published and demonstrated in one of our surgical courses by our colleague from holland and we have been practicing that since and we have had good result putting a simple purse string suture we have done another surgery day before also uh, for um, a doctor from uh, uh, darbhanga <coughs> another scenario right operated elsewhere for c2 to c4 posterior stabilization and a c2 to c7 laminectomy weakness improved but he had a drop neck you can see the drop neck and uh, his quality of life was totally compromised and we had to do a occipital cervical fixation for him to regain that quality of life so these were some scenarios there can be plenty others this is a huge topic to be covered outcomes such as pain disability or satisfaction may be less favorable in patients who undergo revision surgery than in those who do not it also adds to the financial and resource burden of course uh, in the sport trial also there were similar findings uh, that they came across and it has also been seen that um, pre operative psychological predisposition is also important and we have to manage that in order to have good outcomes in addition to doing our surgical work in such patients friends uh, the dictum is prevention then uh, prevention is better than cure has special relevance patient optimization and overall post operative complication prevention is the principal guideline for all spine surgeries and if we plan our surgeries well we can prevent some of this revision surgeries of course uh, we can't have a zero error uh, zero error there will be revisions which will be required but taking into consider the consideration the complexity if we plan well we can reduce the incidence uh, again this study showed that by limiting the number of fusion levels you can reduce the risk of future reoperation of course that is a different chapter if you ask gautam how to reduce the chance of uh, pjk gautam will say you can have a conference by itself on this topic so that is beyond the scope of the talk but we all should be aware about what we need to follow to be able to reduce these dreaded complications friends revision surgery is best prevented as outcomes can be inferior to primary surgery with higher costs and potential complications appropriate primary surgery is the key to it again 
not all that looks bad needs to be revised right we don't need to treat the x-ray or the mri many of them may have suboptimal radiological outcomes but if the quality of life is not getting affected and if deferring the surgery doesn't lead to a poorer outcomes one can always defer the surgery and see how the patient does with the conservative management meticulous history timeline of events and clinical radiological correlation is paramount to identify the correct etiology and again reinforcing failing to plan is planning to fail it happened in one of our child which had marfanoid features and had a pjk may have happened even otherwise but now every patient that we operate upon for deformity we specifically look into it so we learn by experience we will make errors but it is always important to learn from it thanking all of you once again for your patient listening and for giving me this opportunity thank you